everyone. Welcome to Digital Media E10. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm uh, very excited about today, as I always am, uh, because we get to continue working with exposure, which is, of course, a very fascinating, interesting topic. We get to delve into some of the related things that we really didn't get a chance to talk about last week when we were talking about the most fundamental aspects of exposure. But also, I'm, I'm excited because um, we, we have some images that we're going to show at the very end of this class. You might recall a few weeks ago that we were talking about, as part of the, the critique and the particip participation, we're hoping that not only will you submit your photos to critique on the course blog, but also you will show one of your photos either in section or in lecture. Hopefully you'll be, there will be an opportunity for you, or there should be, there, there has to be an opportunity for you to do one or both. And so we're going to begin uh, doing that this week. And if you haven't yet sort of given that any thought, if for some reason we try to offer as many sections as we could, given the constraints of, of our staff and, and their, uh, their schedules, and also with the, the schedules of everyone who submitted the surveys to us, um, but if you are unable to attend one of the sections, then do let us know, even if you're at a distance, then do let us know and we'll be able to show one of your work uh, in lecture, even though you're not able to be physically present. Um, but speaking of at a distance, just as a reminder, as always, we are on, on Skype right now, Expo Digiphoto, and that's the same for our sections, which, by the way, we have announced the final section schedule that will persist for the duration of the semester, and it is as follows. It is for an in-person section. It's Wednesdays here uh, in Harvard Square at 5.30 p.m. Eastern, led by Shelley in 125 Mount Auburn Street. All this information can be found on the course website. And we have two online sections, one on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. and another on Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. Please try to attend one of these sections, whether it's online or in person. The Wednesday sections will cover material from the previous week, and the Thursday one will cover for material for that week. So basically, it's as you would expect. The section material will cover uh, what was last covered, in, or what was covered in the just previous lecture, basically. And it's a great way to not only go over some questions or material that you have questions on, but also to show off your own images, get sort of a critique on those in person, and also get to know some of your classmates. That will be very important for some of the subsequent problem sets and projects. Um, hopefully, I'm not, I was not too subtle about that particular hint, but we'll talk about that. Speaking of projects and problem sets, I did just want to do a quick reminder for the due dates of some of the items. Um, in particular, project one is due tonight, so in a few hours at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. It's now um, 7.45 p.m. Eastern Time, so if you haven't done it yet, um, if you haven't submitted yet, hopefully you'll be able to do that soon. Hopefully you already have the images ready to go. It's getting a little late to just take the images uh, for the purposes of the project. Problem set two is due this coming Wednesday at the same time, 11.59 p.m. And project two was just released today, as of a few hours ago. And we'll talk more about this throughout the, the lecture. But basically, this is one of the ones that, um, and, and I don't really want, don't want to overuse the term excited, but all the staff are really excited because every year, this is the one that produces phenomenal results. Everybody steps up, and we're hoping that you will as well. And basically, the idea is to make a large project for yourself. And there's some, there's some work involved. So you'll see if you read the project specification that we give a couple of ideas to get you started. So for example, you might want to do an extremely long exposure. Maybe you want to take one of those star trail like photos. The point is not to take an exposure that's just 15 minutes or so like the demo that I had in class or like the image that was in class, but to actually put some time and effort into planning this. This is not a trivial photograph to take when you have to go outside for two or three hours Make sure that you are in a dark enough location, far enough away from city lights and that sort of thing that would ruin your image. And also, the moon will be a factor. It just so happens um, that today, I think right now, is the new moon. So it's not necessarily going to be ideal in a couple of weeks' time, but you might still be able to work with it there. Fortunately, it's, we only have two weeks really to devote to this project. But still, that's just some of the, some of the considerations that you have to make. There's other ideas as well. Uh, some people in the past have tried making their own lenses. So tilt-shift lenses are types of lenses that we'll be talking about. You also 
can have access to um, the 3D printer that we have access to. It's not going to be, it's that I would be wary in sort of relying on that and sort of printing you a fabulous lens, but it will, if you really need to, and if you have the experience in modeling and doing th those sorts of things, you'll be able to use that to your advantage towards this end. But there's a lot more information in the specification, and please do read it over. There's a lot of inspiration in there as well that we've tried to link to for a variety of these things. We'll talk about some more ideas throughout this particular class. Um, so the submission tool, of course, is up and, up and running. Do continue to submit to that submission tool and let us know if there are um, any questions. Now, the past few weeks, or rather just last week, not the past few weeks, we've been talking about exposure. And last week we really covered the three most fundamental things and tacked on the fourth one somewhat tongue-in-cheek by saying that light is sort of the thing that really allows us to, that, that's the most fundamental aspect that, al that allows us to control using these shutter and ex aperture and ISO values. So shutter speed, of course, was this idea that we would be able to open that shutter for longer and expose our sensor to increasing amounts of light if necessary. If we have less light, then would necessarily be ideal. But this also has that sort of side effect of allowing motion blur and how we can use that. This, this idea of motion blur, what it actually means for our images. Uh, the, don't recall also the difference between motion blur in the subject. So if you're able to keep your camera absolutely still, but you have a subject that's moving around with a long enough shutter speed, you will actually get some motion blur there. The distinction between that and also the motion blur due to your camera. So these are all things to keep in mind as you're working with shutter speed. Then we talked about ISO and put sensitivity in quotes because it's not tr actually truly what's happening in the context of a digital camera, but it's a close enough approximation for us to think of it that way, certainly for our purposes now. And, um, but in a few weeks' time, we'll notice that we'll be able to talk about the distinction about what, why this is not actually talking about sensitivity. And we started building from this additional exposure value the idea of controlling this, the side effects of these various exposure values by altering one and therefore being able to alter the other. So for example, increasing the ISO, increasing the, the so-called sensitivity of the sensor would allow us to have a faster shutter speed to freeze motion just a little bit more. And then at the end of class, we started running out of a little bit of time, but I started talking about uh, aperture and the significant ratio here, which is that the, the F number itself, which is what? What defines the F number? Any ideas? Yeah, so focal length over diameter. It's the equation shown at the very top of this particular slide, but just shown in sort of compact form, the focal length divided by the diameter, where the diameter is, in fact, the diameter of the aperture inside, which is not necessarily the smallest piece of glass that's inside of your, uh, that's inside of your lens, but it is actually a physical device that will close down and reduce the amount of light entering into the lens, very much like the iris in your eye. And the focal length is, uh, we, we discussed it in a very brief way, saying that this was essentially the zoom level of your particular lens. And so if you wanted to talk about uh, the effects of aperture on your photograph, for example, isolating your subject from your background, how you really want to have an F number that's as low as possible, but there's a variety of things that impact actually the background blur, including having a very large focal length, the largest focal length you can, and reducing the F number as much as possible, thereby having a very large diameter um, aperture will ensure that you get the most amount of background blur for your particular image. And conversely, if you wanted to extend your depth of field and try to have as much as possible in focus, you would do the opposite. You would try to have, use a wide lens and you would try to stop down, which is another way of saying you would try to reduce the size of the aperture, which is another way of saying you would increase the F number. And one of the things that we didn't really get a chance to talk about in depth is the math behind the pinhole. So we could actually calculate the F number ratio. And as a result, because we're able to measure the distance between a lens and the focal plane, you might remember that focal plane icon that exists on camera bodies, we could actually measure the focal length of the pinhole 
and by calculating its F number, figure out its diameter. And I, we didn't have a chance to talk about it last, um, last week at all, but I did, post the, um, I did post the document that goes into detail about all of these things. A little bit more detail about F number, the ratio itself, why those F numbers are sort of strangely spaced. They start at F1 and F1.4, and they go up through the scale of 2 and 2.8 and 4 and 5.6 and so on. Each of those each of those numbers representing a stop difference in the exposure for our particular camera. And you might recall that we talked about the, um, a way of simplifying your, how you can remember these numbers. Do you, does anybody remember what that trick is? What is that trick that allows us to remember the major f-stops uh, in corresponding to numbers? Any ideas? Yeah, exactly. So we'll start at F1 and F1.4, and then what? And then you double each F2, double 1.4 to get F2.8, double F2 to get F4, and so on and so forth. Now realize that this is just an approximation. It breaks down after we get to about F32 or so. After this, it does, in fact, become a little inaccurate. And so one of the reasons why I refer you to this document is because we talk about precisely how these numbers are derived, why these numbers are seen to be so crazily spaced. The spoiler is basically that they're separated by multiples of root 2 because of this idea that we were dealing with the ratio of the diameter rather than the area of the, of the aperture, which is really what is allowing the amount of light to enter into the lens. But this is all demystified in this particular document. And the very end of it, we actually are able to calculate the size of that pinhole lens that we were talking about at the very beginning of class. And the spoiler is that we estimate it to be about 0.5 millimeters in diameter. So I'm pretty proud of that. I think my needlework is relatively good. This is probably not precisely accurate. There's, there's definitely some error here because we did some rounding, especially with regard to how many stops difference there was. But this is uh, close enough with probably about within order of magnitude. And so I'm pretty happy with that result there. If you do have any questions, do be sure to take a look at that and ask away in, um, in section. Or, of course, ask the course staff by email. Um, all right, so let's come back. So we talked about then the big four things that really matter for our exposure, which is the amount of available light, shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. And one of the things that we'll really focus on today is this first idea, one of the most important ones, the amount of available light that we actually have and how we can try to Im improve or reduce the amount of light that we have in the scene. You might recall some of the things that we were talking about, underexposure, overexposure, sometimes it's both. And these are all very bad things uh, when in, in your image. It can really impact the power of your image. And there's a lot of things that we didn't really get a chance to talk about last week with how you can actually fix these problems. Some of them you can fix in software. You could perhaps take some several exposures, if perhaps you happen to be lucky enough to be in a scene that is not changing very much. Perhaps it's not, uh, perhaps it's just a landscape scene, for example, and really the only thing you have to worry about is the sun moving across the frame or the moon moving across the frame or the rotation of the earth causing the stars to be slightly different. But still, if you, can, if you do this fast enough and take several different exposures at different levels of, of brightness, let's say you take one that's properly exposed, one that's a little bit darker, a little bit underexposed, and one a little bit brighter, later on in software you can stitch them all together. And if you've done a good enough job maintaining your camera's position, then you can really ensure that you get a nice result out of that and sort of cause give yourself a little bit more leeway. This idea is called bracketing. Many cameras have support for bracketing already built in, and they allow you to quickly take three, five, or even more images at various exposure, at, uh, at various stops difference from the center exposure, which is kind of an interesting idea and pretty neat. Some of the other things that you can do, though, are in particular if you have, for example, um, some an area, uh, like in this upper right photo, where you have both 
underexposure and overexposure depending on the scene. Perhaps you have, for example, a portrait photograph that you're trying to take a picture of somebody, but the sun is behind them and the sun is very overpowering. So you get uh, this very dark image of the person themselves and a very bright image of the sky. You can use a variety of tactics like a reflector. So even if you just use a large white sheet and reflect some of that sunlight back to that person, maybe you could use, um, and be careful about blinding them, but you, maybe you could use one of those sun visors for cars, for example, you know, those um, sort of metallic looking ones that reflect a lot of light to keep the heat outside of cars. You can go to Walmart, buy those for $5, use that as a reflector. And there's, of course, photographic specific reflectors that have each of these things, they cost, they tend to cost a little bit of money, but you can certainly use a homegrown solution for one of these ideas instead and provide a little extra light to your subject to try to smooth out the difference between the background and the foreground in that way. And one of the other things that we'll talk about today is fill flash. Perhaps you can actually provide extra illumination by using a lamp or even a flash and to, and give more photons to that underexposed area of your scene in that way. Of course, the power of good light is really what is important. Choosing a time of day, I can't stress this enough. I think I've mentioned it at least once every week, and this week is no different, but just be sure you pick the right time of day for your photograph. It can really make a big difference in, the, in its appearance and, your, and how pleased you are with it. And of course, there are ways that we can intentionally over and underexpose as well. We might have a studio setup where we want to take pictures of objects, uh, perhaps we are about to eBay something and we want to take a nice picture of it. We might want to use some techniques to try to overexpose the background intentionally to give that very isolated look to the object that we are taking a picture of. Now, all of this discussion that we've had talks about our control of the camera, but what you will find is that very rarely will you set your camera to a fully manual mode and set all of these three exposure values to something that you want. Generally, our photography has to be a little bit faster than that. Unless you become, unless you're already very, very skilled at this, or unless you want to be, which by the way, is not a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination. Generally, what will happen is that we will rely on our camera's automatic mode in some form or another, but still retain some control over it. And so even if you came into this class using the fully automatic modes of your camera on a regular basis, there's still this idea of the fact that the camera has to record, has to detect the amount of available light in the scene and adjust these same three settings that we've been talking about in order to capture a properly exposed image. But how does this actually work? This is a, a, a technique called metering that the camera does. You might hear this term uh, within the context of cameras or if you look at the specifications or even a review of camera, it will talk about it, the, the camera's metering. And this encompasses a wide range of topics, including how the camera actually knows what settings to use. Well, really, the camera is not very smart it, in, in many ways. It does not have the context of the scene. It does not understand the context of the scene to try to decide for you what those exposure settings should actually be. Almost all cameras will try that have automatic metering will try to make the overall exposure this sort of middle gray. There is this idea of having this, this middle gray that is either called 18% or 12% gray, depending on, on, who, on, on who you ask, which indicates the amount of, of reflectance of a particular shade of gray. And it's basically just this, and it's basically exactly what it looks like. It is just this middle gray. It's not too bright, it's not too dark. The camera knows, you might recall that when we were talking about this sensor a little bit, the sensor has a limitation to how many photons it can actually accept. Too few, and we won't see any detail because it's too dark. Too many, we won't see any detail because it's too bright, and we'll just completely wash away all of the detail in that setting, or all of the detail in that scene, rather. So the camera knows that it has to sort of expose for precisely the middle of that range, and that is what is defined as middle gray within the context of that camera. So it looks at the scene and it tries to decide what the overall intensity of the brightness in that scene is and it will try to adjust those three exposure settings to match this level of gray. But there's a lot of modes that, can actually, um, that you can actually leverage to try to 
give your camera a little bit more context to try to help your camera decide what the scene, what is actually going on in the scene and how it can actually expose the photograph properly. There's a couple of different metering modes. One of them is called spot metering. And in spot metering, it doesn't try to take an average of the entire scene, but instead it takes only the center 3% or so of the pixels or of the scene itself as seen through the lens. And then it will decide that, that all, of, all of that area right in the center of that image should be the thing that should be metered to middle gray. And this can be very powerful if you have a scene with very high contrast. You have some areas that are very dark and in the shadows, and you have some areas that are very light. Or maybe you have just one of those things. Maybe you have an image that is predominantly dark. Perhaps you're trying to achieve a, a, a photograph like this, for example, one of these two photographs. If we were to allow the camera to try to expose this entire scene for that middle gray, what would happen? What would happen in the case that we asked our camera to take a picture of this, assuming that every portion of the image had the same relevance, the same importance to its exposure? How do you think the camera would respond in this scene? It would underexpose it. Yeah, that's right. Because there's areas here that are extremely bright and are overpowering the image but it has no context of what you are trying to do. It doesn't understand that what you're trying to do achieve is in fact this exact idea. So what it will do is it will try to make everything this overall gray and what you will notice is that your background that should be white is actually not white. It's this gray kind of dark muddled color and as a result your subject is also underexposed. And likewise do we have a similar thing here? where if we take a picture of this with just pure automatic mode, just using uh, standard metering, what we would notice is that everything would be too bright or overexposed as it tries to bring the dark areas of the image brighter. You would therefore make your subject far too bright. So using something like spot metering allows us to tell the camera precisely what we want to meter. One of the settings that you might have, not all cameras have this, this spot metering, by the way, but it can be a very powerful feature in your particular camera. One of the things that we can do is look at the scene ourselves and especially look at the subject and sort of decide what would be an area that's representative of the middle gray of the proper exposure. It would probably be something around here, I would say. Just, some, just sort of randomly picking a spot because that appears to be sort of the properly exposed middle gray area of the scene. So by pointing my camera with its spot meter at that location, do I know that it will then meter the whole scene just for that small point in the center of the frame. So this means that you will sometimes have this idea of separating your metering from your focus. And this is another really powerful idea that if you actually don't use the same point to meter your shot as to focus your shot, that you can achieve a lot. So in this particular example, it is perhaps one and the same to say that we do in fact have something that we want to focus on is the same thing that we also want to meter, but not all situations are in fact like that. Sometimes what you will see is that if a person is wearing a, a white shirt, for example, and they're outside and it's the middle of the day, that person will be generally very bright, and especially their, their shirt will be very bright. So perhaps what you want to do is to meter on something on the background, which is more representative of the exposure of this middle gray exposure, and then recompose your shot, focus on the person, and then actually take your shot. So separating this auto exposure from the auto focusing can be a very powerful idea. So take a look at your camera settings and see what, if anything, your camera will allow you to do. Generally cameras will have at least an auto exposure lock which means that you can point your camera at a particular direction, meter the scene for that that it's, that it's looking at, and lock the exposure, and then change the, the camera to then focus and then take the picture. And so in combination, you can then properly expose your photograph and focus on the thing that you wanted to focus as well. Now contrast this with another type of metering, so again, this is spot metering. In spot metering, we find 
typically only on higher end cameras, I would say. It's, I think it's a little bit more rare to find it on, on pretty much every camera um, these days. Um, but, but center weighted metering tries to have a, uh, a more balanced version of this. So whereas in our first example, we had the camera that tried to make everything in the scene this middle gray, it will take, in center, meter, in center weighted metering, the camera will look at the, the center of the image and assume that the subject is there. And this is actually a pretty good idea for the way that most people take their photos, which is to say that they will take their subject, center it, and then take the photo. And because presumably the subject of the photo is the thing that should be properly exposed, this center weighted metering is a pretty valid assumption for a lot of the types of photographs that we might have taken in the past. But now probably as you're working your photography a little bit more and, and participating in the blog and getting critique on your photos, you're probably noticing that one of the things that you want to do is to not always center your subject in the middle of your frame. Perhaps you actually want to put it off to the side and provide a little bit more power in that way. This is, of course, not a hard and fast rule, but it's just one of the techniques that you will probably employ in the upcoming weeks, if not already. And so center-weighted metering then restricts you because it is perhaps then not your subject that is in the center of the frame, but instead the background, which might be improperly exposed in your case. So take a look at the metering modes that your camera has. It probably has something like center-weighted metering. It probably has something like an all-averaged metering, which is that very naive representation of taking the entire scene and averaging everything to some middle gray. But many cameras nowadays have something called zone metering, where it tries to understand a little bit more of the context behind the photograph that you're taking. And essentially what happens is it will take the photograph or rather, it takes the scene as it's viewing it through the lens, and it will split it into hundreds or thousands of zones and try to analyze each to try to figure out what it is that you actually want to meter. So in this case, and it's very different, a lot of these zone meterings tend to be um, proprietary to the manufacturer. So you'll probably see some cameras boast a 63 zone, area, metering area. Some of them will say, oh, we have 2,000 zone area. It doesn't really matter the number of zones. It doesn't really, frankly, matter the difference between these different types of metering. What will matter is how you understand and how you learn and grow with your camera to understand how the metering is going to behave in a variety of circumstances and how you can overcome its limitations. But anyway, coming back to this idea of zone metering, there's a couple of things that the camera will try to do to place some additional context and try to do a better job metering your photograph. In particular, by splitting it into a lot of zones, it might be able to figure out which of those zones are actually in focus, and therefore which of those zones might actually be representative of your subject, and place more emphasis on properly exposing those zones, those areas of your image that are actually properly focused. Perhaps it also takes into account the distance to the subject. Um, this, might be, this might impact then, in a similar way, the, 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 focus of the, um, of the, the focus of the image, rather the subject of the image, and how it should alter the zones in that manner. Or if it, if it is able to understand this information, maybe it will understand that areas that are out of focus are very bright, and so that there are some elements of backlighting to this, this photograph and try to compensate in that way. But even so, one of the things that you'll notice as you work with this is that even if you use your camera's fancy zone metering, it's still going to be imperfect. But all of the things that you learned last week are not useless anymore. It's still very relevant to understand what shutter speed does, how the shutter speed actually impacts your camera, how the F number impacts, not your camera, rather the image, how F number actually impacts your image, how ISO impacts your image, and altogether, you want to get that proper exposure while still being able to modify each of those. And so typically, so for example, what I tend to do is I tend to use like aperture priority mode, which allows me to have control over the F number, but allows the camera to decide what shutter speed it actually should be to properly expose the photograph. This simplifies my task just a little bit, but still allows me some control over the camera and over the exposure but I still am at the mercy of my camera's metering. 
in particular, there's a lot of these problems that can occur when the camera does not understand the scene, does not understand what it is that I'm trying to do, and takes the exposure with incorrect settings. So one of the things that will be extremely important as you work with photography is this idea of exposure compensation. Almost always, I would say, are you going to be using some form of automatic control, unless you happen to be in a studio setting with very controlled lighting, and then you want to always specify manual control and have that continuity, have that consistency across all of your photographs. There are, of course, exceptions to each of these things. But when you're outside in dynamic light or even taking photographs of an event or of a scene where the light is changing constantly, you want to have some benefit, perhaps, some help in actually achieving your, um, your goal. But there's a lot of things that will confuse this automatic mode, including things that have a lot of backlighting, anything that provides very strong quantities of, of brightness or very strong quantities of shadows. So snow, for instance, will be one of the things that almost always trips up your camera. You can take a picture of it, and you may look at the picture on your camera, and you may be like, OK, that's a pretty good picture of snow. You go home, and you download it, and you see it, and you, and you, you still appreciate the image, but something doesn't seem quite right. The colors seem kind of muted, perhaps. Maybe the, 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 the scene itself just seems a bit dark. And this is your camera's automatic exposure, getting it wrong and making the overall exposure too dark. It's underexposing it, and you need to tell the camera that you want, in fact, a brighter exposure. So in this way, we use exposure compensation to overcome these limitations. So snow, backlighting, sunset, sunrises. If you happen to go to New Mexico, they have a white sands area, and this is exactly the same thing, where we have a lot of white in the scene, and it will, in fact, mess up our automatic exposure. Conversely, on the other end, we might have uh, an area with lots of shadows. So if, for example, you happen to be outside and taking pictures, especially here in New England in the winter, and people are wearing a lot of dark jackets, but you try to capture a, por a portrait of that person, that dark jacket, if, it's, if that person is sort of the predominant subject in your photograph, will be very dark and will confuse your camera into making the scene overall way too bright. Anything that's dark, really, lots of shadows. I would wager that if you were to take a photo of me standing right here, for example, just using your automatic exposure, because of the brightness of the projector, I would tend to be underexposed, as it tries to properly expose the brightness of this projector. But perhaps that's not, in fact, what you wanted. So you can use this idea of exposure compensation. And we generally see it as abbreviated as EV. And this very image, in fact, had to have some amount of exposure compensation in order to properly take it. So on the left is the image without any exposure compensation. This was not as shot. I just happened to know that because I was in a, in a scene with a lot of white that I was going to have to increase the exposure compensation to tell the camera that I want it to be brighter. So the way to think about this is that when you're in a scene that has a lot of bright areas, snow, for instance, or a lot of white, or very backlit, for example, you will want to increase it. You want to increase your exposure compensation to tell the camera that that scene should be brighter than it thinks. So if it's bright, turn it up. If it's dark, turn it down. And so on the left, then, is the scene as, as would have been shot without any exposure compensation. All of, this, all of the sand confused it in, in a certain way, not to anth anthropomorphize my camera, but still, it confused it in a sense that it thought that the scene was overall darker than it was, even though it was not, in fact, that dark. So increasing the exposure compensation by a value of 1, which, by the way, corresponds to one stop of exposure compensation, then doubled the amount of light entering into my camera through some variation of those exposure values on that, I, that I captured with my camera and captured the proper amount of light to properly expose this image. So sometimes what you will see on your camera is the ability to use exposure compensation in increments of a third or a half of a stop. And this is actually very important because generally, you're not going to use something as drastic as one stop of exposure compensation. That's quite a lot. 
And you might recall that before I said that what appears to us as being a doubling or having of light is not necessarily what it actually appears to be. So even though this again is, is not necessarily representative of, of a true doubling or having in the number of photons, this is what the camera would have seen at half the amount of light in that particular scene. So in other words, we have this dark scene, we wanted to increase its exposure compensation in order to tell the camera that it was in fact brighter, so we added one stop of exposure compensation to this image. So if we actually look at the, um, the exposure values used in this image, we can see everything that made it possible. So it was at 1 125th of a second using f2.8 to try to isolate my brother, who is the subject in the photograph, a little bit from the background, using ISO 200 and plus one stop of exposure compensation. So before I turned this exposure value to plus one, before I added a stop of exposure compensation, what would my settings, what could have my settings been? So in other words, if I turn this back down to plus zero EV, given the same amount of light, how different would my exposure settings be? So by pointing at this, my camera at the scene and asking it before I had input any exposure compensation, asking it to tell me what the exposure settings it thinks I should use, what would it be before adjusting it to be a stop brighter? Yeah, exactly. One sixtieth of a second different is, is uh, a stop darker. And so that is perhaps one of the things that my camera could have told me. So in this case, that's probably exactly what happened because I probably had specified ISO 200. And I had probably specified F2.8. And it was the shutter speed that the camera was allowed to vary. So as I increased my exposure compensation, wait, we got that backwards. It should be darker. Um, so it's 1 250th of a second that it would have told me. So 1 60th of a second would have been brighter. So to put this, so to phrase this just a little bit differently, because I think one of the th things that confused me at first about exposure compensation was why do I want to add brightness to a scene that's already bright? That's not the correct way to think about it necessarily. The correct way to think about it is how the, the, the camera is actually looking at this. A bright scene, again, will tell the camera, or the camera will think that it should make it too dark. So what you want to do is to pull the camera up and say, OK, I really want it to be a bright scene. That is what I know that it is. So by adding a stop of exposure compensation, I'm then telling my camera to let in a stop more light. So whereas my my shutter uh, value at one stop uh, of exposure compensation was 1 125th of a second. Before, recall that it would have been too dark. So it would be 1 250th of a second before I added that exposure compensation. And sometimes this doesn't matter. Like in this case, that shutter speed is already fast enough for me, for me to be able to take this photograph. But sometimes you are right on the edge of a hand-holdable shutter speed. And by increasing your exposure compensation, by increasing your exposure value, you then are making the shutter speed too slow for you to be able to hand-hold it anymore. This seems to happen to me all the time, especially if I'm outside at dusk or whenever, or whenever I'm taking a picture in the evening. Sort of that ideal time comes and goes very quickly with regard to the nice amount of light that we have from, from the sun. But anyway, as, as it gets darker, I have to try to um, adjust the shutter speed. And very quickly do I realize that my shutter speed is just getting too slow. It's just getting too slow. And so if I have to increase the exposure compensation because the scene needs to be brighter than my camera thinks it should be, then I can get into trouble more quickly in that regard. 
And conversely, you might have the other situation as well, where you have a scene that's very dark, but it's already very, very bright outside. So perhaps you're taking a silhouette photo, for example, of the sunset. It, you might already be at an extremely fast shutter speed and trying to turn down the exposure compensation to tell it that you want the scene to be darker because perhaps you want to capture that silhouette means that your camera cannot actually take a photograph at any faster of a shutter speed. So these are, these are nuances. These are nuances that you might notice as you're actually working with your camera in this idea, in, with this idea of having exposure compensation. But the main takeaway is what we've already described, that you have a camera that is going to try to meter, using some form of automatic mode, a scene for some sort of middle gray. And because it does not understand the scene, because it does not understand the context of the scene, it will sometimes get it wrong. And you have to give it an additional hint about what you want for that scene. If the scene should be brighter, then the camera will see it. So in other words, if you have a lot of snow, if you have a lot of white sand or a very backlit area and you want to properly illuminate your subject, you need to tell the camera to increase its thought, its, its thought process, so to speak, to make sure that you are able to get that subject properly exposed. And likewise, if it's too dark, if you have something that's meant to be a very dark image, lots of shadows in it, and you think that the camera will, in fact, take a picture that's too bright, then you'll turn down the exposure compensation. Any questions on exposure compensation, I either compensating using a positive value or compensating using a negative value? All right. Well, this alludes to a couple of the things that we've been talking about with regard to metering, and that is that there are a lot of metering modes that your camera might actually have. And one of the things that I've, I've, that I've noticed and that you might notice as well is that the, the more the camera is meant to be for very advanced, very professional users, the fewer metering modes it actually has. And the reason for this is because the, presumably the folks that use these sorts of cameras that, that have uh, a lot of experience with their camera probably already know how to tell the camera to do what they want. So they don't perhaps need quite as much assistance. And that's one of the goals of last week and this week is to reduce your reliance upon all of these different metering modes that your camera might have. I've seen a couple of, uh, of my friends' cameras and family's cameras, they have a uh, they, they have literally dozens of different modes now, and it's, it's just gotten worse. They have, um, I think there is several different party modes. There were several beach modes. There were several ski modes. I think there was a ski mode and a snowboard mode in one camera, which doesn't make any sense because it's all effectively the same thing. But there's no magic that your camera is doing with these sorts of modes. It is just manipulating these three exposure values that we've talked about last week and some of these modes might perhaps try to give a clue, some context to the camera so that it itself will be able to do some exposure compensation. So if you were to say that it was a ski mode or a snowboard mode or you know, any sort of mode like that, it might try to realize that the, you want a higher exposure compensation so that the snow will appear brighter. But really these are just specific tricks that the camera will do and it's nothing that you cannot achieve yourself in perhaps even a better way. By using one of the, the more basic automatic modes, you can still achieve the exact exposure that you want and not have a reliance on any of these things and have more control over those side effects of each of these exposure values on your image. So on the left is a meter dial for a, uh, a Nikon D40X, which is a few years old now. And we can sort of go around this whole dial and figure out exactly what we think the camera would do in each of these cases. So you'll notice that right now the, the little white um, mark indicating which one is selected is probably selected at either A or S. Uh, we'll start at A, which is representative of the aperture priority mode, which is the one that I had alluded to earlier, which basically means that you get full control over the F number. 
you specify precisely the F number that you want to use, and the camera will try to automatically figure out the shutter speed that would result from that based on its own metering of the scene. And some cameras have automatic ISO as well, and some cameras do not um, require you to specify the ISO in advance. But in either case, it's still sort of the same idea. We still would get to set the ISO, and the camera would automatically pick the shutter speed that it thinks would be appropriate for that scene with the F number that I had selected. Now, conversely, there's the S mode on that dial on the left, which represents shutter speed priority or time priority. And what this does is the opposite. It allows you to specify the shutter speed that you want to use, and it will try to vary the, the aperture, the F number, to try to meet that shutter speed. Now, one time I really geeked out with all of the, all of the photos that I took and ran a script. I wrote a script and ran a script on all of the exit data, on all of the photos, to find out how many times I've used the various modes. And I think it was something like 99.6% or some ridiculously high value do I use aperture priority. It was followed closely by, or not closely, it was followed, this, you know, the second distant, the, the distant second place was a bulb or a manual mode because I was probably taking a very long exposure. I'll talk more about bulb mode in just a second. But very rarely do I use shutter speed priority. And the reason for that is that your camera's, uh, your camera's lens has a much narrower range of F numbers that it can produce compared to the range of possible shutter values. So if your lens is capable of taking photos with a maximum F number of F4, and by maximum I mean a maximum aperture size, the number itself is, is of course very small here, and to have a minimum aperture size of about F16, how many stops difference is that between these two values? So from F4 to F16 is how many stops Variance. Is it 4? So we go from 4 to 5.6, 5.6 to 8, 8 to 11, 11 to 16. So we have five stops. So, it's very, so that's, that's very close. So we have five stops difference between these two values. Now compare that to the usual typical range of shutter speed values on a typical camera, which might be something like, let's just be somewhat conservative here and say one two thousandth of a second, even though most likely it's much faster than that, all the way up to, say, 30 seconds. So what is the difference in number of stops here? This is, I actually don't even know this one. This one will take a little while to figure out. But we could say 30 seconds to 15 is one. Uh, down to seven seconds is two, down to about three seconds is three. We could keep going, you know, one and a half down to 0.75, but already we're at five, we're not even at, we're not even that fast yet. So the short, the takeaway of this is that this range is much, much higher than this range. So the range of possible shutter speed values in terms of varying your exposure is much higher for shutter speed than it is for F number. And what this means, to come back to this idea of using the aperture priority mode most, uh, most of the time, is that this means that it is much rarer for me to encounter a situation where my camera cannot, given the F number that I've provided to it, it cannot take a photo at a specific shutter speed. So sometimes what will happen is the camera, if it's way too bright, for example, it will flash one eight thousandths of a second because that's the fastest my camera can possibly go and it's warning me that it cannot go any faster even though it needs to. And I noticed that by using time priority and I really wanted to get a specific time, uh, a specific shutter speed out of that camera, it was not able to vary the F number enough to compensate for that difference in light. So the vast majority of the time I use aperture mode. Is that going to be the right option for you? I don't know. Um, but for that reason, I think there's sort of this mathematical basis behind it that makes it a little bit easier to use, perhaps, than shutter, shutter priority. Now the P, if we are to continue along going counterclockwise on this dial, the P is program mode. It basically allows you to vary both the shutter and the F number at the same time. So it decides on a particular exposure value, and it picks an F number, and it picks a shutter speed, and then you get to pick 
or you, you, rather you get to alter both of those one by one um, in one go. And this is uh, reasonably nice, but I like to have just a little bit more control than that. And so that's why I tend not to use that one. All right, so we keep going full automatic mode. This green portion on the dial here means that the camera is allowed to completely decide what it wants in terms of all of three exposure settings and how that, how that photo will look as a result. Now there's a no flash mode after that. It's the, it's the little no flash icon, flash prohibited icon. But let's keep going. We find that the next one is basically a picture of a person. So this is presumably which mode? Portrait. Yeah, portrait mode. So what would we want to do in a portrait mode? What does that mean? What are we trying to achieve in a portrait mode? What would be the most important settings for us to, that, that we actually care about in a portrait mode? What we're trying to get out here is to try to decide what the camera is programmed to do at each of these different modes. And again, there's no magic that happens here. They only alter each of these three exposure settings. But in portrait mode, what might we want? I'm sorry? The color of the skin. The color of the skin. So we want to try to make sure that they that the subject is properly exposed. And along those same lines, we want to try to make sure that the subject is isolated from the background. This is a picture of a person. So really what we want to focus on is that person themselves, including the exposure of the skin, but also the focus. Yeah, did you have an idea? Yeah, exactly. So we want to have as low of an F number as possible, to have the lowest F stop possible to really isolate the person from the background. And so even though this is a fully automatic mode, setting it to portrait mode, the camera is trying to prioritize the F number and try to make it as small as possible, try to make the F number itself as small as possible, make the aperture as big as possible to make sure that that person is, isol is as isolated from the background as possible. And then the other things like the shutter and the ISO are not quite as important in that regard. And we can keep going. There's a landscape mode, which probably confers some ideas there. There's a child. So what, would the, what might the child mode or the baby mode or whatever that mode is, what that might imply? Yeah, so it probably is very similar to sports, which is, might be the next one. It's kind of hard to tell because it's upside down. But both of those are probably fairly similar, probably because it, it indicates that the subject is going to be moving very quickly it's probably going to prioritize the shutter to be very fast. So what is the point of all of this? Why are we talking about all this? It's just to point out that your camera may have all of these modes and perhaps more, perhaps any number of party modes and beach modes and ski modes or what have you. But there's no need for you to use these. You can just, by knowing what it is that you want to achieve with the, those three exposure settings, can you set one of these other modes instead and adjust the camera settings to reflect your needs for that particular shot. Now one, uh, so we talked just a moment ago about how the m more advanced cameras tend to have fewer modes and really the reason for that is the assumption that people that are using these cameras do not need all of this assistance with these exposure modes. And in fact, that's what we see with the camera on the right, which is a Canon 5D. It's one of the more expensive cameras on, on the market, but it has so few modes compared to what we've seen. And we've talked about a lot of these already. Now, presumably they include the green automatic mode for whenever you trust the stranger enough to give them the, your camera and say, take a picture of me. Presumably that person may not know too much about photography, or at least it's safer to assume that they don't know how to set the ISO and the settings on, on your particular camera, or even if they do know how to do it, what I notice, I actually really, I, I, my heart sinks a little bit when somebody asks me to take a picture for them with their camera, because almost always I have no idea how to use it. And so even though I know what it is that I want to achieve, I have no idea how to change the F number, or I have no idea how to change the ISO on that particular camera, so I'll just quietly set it to the fully automatic mode and do the best that I can um, with that. That's our little secret. You won't tell anybody, right? Um, but a lot of these we'd already talked about. The fully automatic mode, program mode, TV is time priority. It's just Canon's way of saying time priority. 
This is the equivalent to the S mode on the, on the Nikon on the right, where it prioritizes, you get to specify the shutter speed that you want, and it will try to pick the F number. AV is the mode, especially when I had a Canon camera, the one that I use most frequently. Aperture priority or aperture value, that's what the V stands for. M is fully manual mode. You get to fully select all of the three settings for your particular image. And B is bulb. B is the bulb mode that allows you to overcome your camera's maximum shutter limitation. And the way that it works is that, and we discussed this uh, a little bit before, but just to um, review this idea, when you set it to bulb mode, you get to pick the F number that you want, and you get to pick the ISO that you want. But in order to, to get the shutter speed that you want, you have to push and hold the shutter button for as long as you want it to be open. Now, for those of you that decide to attempt the ultra-long exposure shot for Project 2, this, is going, this mode is going to be your friend. Except that maybe it won't because, and by, by uh, maybe it won't, is that it might be a little bit of a pain to sit with your camera outside in the cold for two or three hours and try not to move your camera even though you're holding down the exposure button. You can imagine how that will get very tiring very quickly. You might accidentally bump your camera, you might accidentally let go and have to restart your shot. So you might want to consider using a remote shutter release for your camera, many of which include a lock of some kind that allow you to click the, um, the shutter button and keep it locked in that way for any amount of time that you want. Just don't forget to set your timer on that camera. Any questions on any of these? Oh, I actually have a list of some more of those modes. So there was self-portrait mode, so selfie mode, there's a party mode, there's a candlelight mode, sunset mode, fireworks mode, beach mode, snow mode. Oh, it's just way too much. Fortunately, we don't have to use any of those anymore from this point on. And in fact, for all of the projects from here on out, we're expecting you to use one of the modes that you would find on a camera like this, either a fully manual mode or at, um, at least or perhaps at worst an aperture or shutter speed priority mode. One of those modes would be the ones that you should strive for in your photographs. It's required for the, problem, for the projects from here on out. So be sure it's good to practice with your camera and even though you're using one of these modes, understand how it meters, get to know your camera a little bit, understand the exposure compensation, try to get it absolutely perfect. All right, any questions on any of that? So just to rehash, we talked about all of these three settings and how by understanding these shutter speed, the ISO and the aperture, we can overcome all of the limitations no, I shouldn't say that. We can overcome some of the limitations of our camera. We can understand the limitations of our camera and, and try to understand how we can overcome those. But let's take a quick five minute break and when we come back, we'll talk about how we can vary the amount of available light to try to overcome even more limitations of our cameras. All right, welcome back. So before the break, I teased a little bit with this ability to actually change the amount of available light that we have in a scene. And perhaps it's an anticlimactic measure to, uh, or response to actually say, well, flash is sort of the obvious one. Now, if you were to dig through the archives of E10, back in the day it used to be called E7, and if you were to dig far enough back to some of the first lectures that were actually posted online, you might actually hear me kind of hate on flash a little bit. And still to this day, I look at a flash like this and I roll my eyes and I'm like, oh, that's going to be terrible there's still some aspects about flash that are kind of disappointing. But a lot of them can actually be fixed. And really to devote only a few minutes to flash like we're going to do tonight is really a disservice to it because there is an enormous amount of technique and skill and equipment involved with flash photography that we could probably create an entirely separate course just on lighting, just on the techniques of lighting, just on the techniques of actually using flash photography, and in fact, I think there is, there is one, isn't there? Yeah, I think there is actually a class on lighting and, and those techniques. And so I definitely encourage you, if you are especially interested in studio lighting or very, very careful setups uh, involving even a combination of natural and artificial light, that you look into that because our, flash is actually a very powerful thing that you can use within your images. 
It just so happens that the vast majority of flash units that are out there that are connected to cameras in this way are just not super great, though they do have some utility as well. Now, a lot of these flashes are, in fact, automatic, but just like exposure, we can actually set them manually, and we'll talk about what some of those settings actually involve. Now, one of the reasons that we have some problems with flash is this fundamental property of light that's coming from a single individual point source that's not a laser. Even though laser does happen a little bit, not quite as bad as this, essentially what this is saying is that we have point source of light. Imagine a light bulb that's just sitting in the middle of the room, in a darkened room, it's just, just sitting there, there's no cover or anything, it's just a light bulb. As we get farther and farther away from that light bulb, if we step close to it and then move farther away from it, you can imagine that the appearance of that bulb is, is not quite as bright. I mean, imagine you, you might have some sort of like sympathetic pain reaction if you were to imagine holding an illuminated light bulb right against your face and looking at it, it would be kind of painful, it's really, really bright. But as you move away from it, very quickly does that amount of light die off due to this property called uh, the inverse square law. And the inverse square law is, has, a, has a lot of implications for us as photographers and also in, in real life scenarios. Essentially what it says is that for every doubling in the amount of distance from a point source, we lose a quarter of that intensity of light. So in other words, for every amount that we move away, for every amount that we move away from a point source, we have to square that to figure out the reduction in light. So if we move from a particular distance, let's say we are one meter away from a point source of light, we move to two meters away, we're not just receiving half the amount of light, we're receiving a quarter because of this inverse square law. We take that, that, uh, that difference in our distance, two divided by one is, is, a, is, a, dis is a difference of two, uh, is a difference in the power of two, not a power of two, a multiplication of two, and therefore we divide that, we, we square that, and one over that value is in fact the reduction in light. So if we now move, whereas before we were a meter away from that light bulb, we now move to three meters away, we're three times as far, which means that we get one ninth the amount of light. And so this has a very relevant idea in photography called light fall off. Is light fall off basically describes this precise phenomenon where we might have, rather than our point source of light, uh, uh, it, rather than it being a light bulb or rather than it being the sun or rather than it being some other light source like that, we're actually talking about a flash unit. So as you double your distance from this flash unit, you are decreasing the amount of light by a quarter. And this has a huge impact on us because as you might recall from all of our discussion up until now, sensors and film has very narrow range of, of exposure beyond which we will not properly expose our image. So a flash unit will really function effectively at a very narrow range away from that flash. And this produces a lot of the results that you might actually experience when using flash. You take a picture of somebody, they have a silly grin on their face and their face is overexposed and everything behind them is really dark. And it's precisely because of this reason. You have the point source of light immediately above your camera and it is very close to them as you are very close to them. And the background is not that much farther, but because of this inverse square law, we're losing that amount of light very, very, very quickly. So keep this in mind, this inverse square law. This is one of the issues that we might have with flash photography. And I'll talk about some of the ways that we can mitigate some of these problems in just a moment. But hopefully not to throw too many equations at you at once. All of these are hopefully relatively simple. The one that we care most about when we're dealing with flash photography is this equation known as the guide number. And the guide number is just that. It's basically a guide to how powerful, and, and we don't really want to say, we don't really want to use the word power, but it does allude a little bit to the idea of how much power a flash actually has. And more precisely, what this guide number is telling us is how far away uh, a subject or an object can be to still properly illuminate that subject. Now, how can we reduce... <coughs> 
how can we reduce all of the complications of a flash to just a single number? Keep in mind that there's a couple of things that actually matter with regard to flash photography. We'll come back to this equation in just a moment. Recall that we talked about the focal plane of, of these cameras. And really what there was was this shutter that opens and closes and exposes the sensor or the film to light. But we, and what we talked about in the first lecture was that these flash units operate in an extremely fast time speed, an extremely fast time range. They operate much more quickly than the shutter does on our camera. They might operate at one sixty-four thousandth of a second, which is really phenomenally fast compared to the movement of the shutter as it exposes or, uh, or, not, or doesn't expose the sensor to the environment. So what this means is that in order for us to properly use our flash unit, we have to set our shutter to what's called the X-Sync speed. And the X-Sync speed is the maximum shutter speed that your camera can open both curtains and expose the entirety of the sensor to the light. Once that entire sensor is exposed, the camera will fire the flash and it will properly illuminate the entire, the, the entire scene within your sensor. If it's faster than the X-Sync speed, if you, set your, if you override the X-Sync speed and, and make your shutter speed much faster than that, typical X-Sync speeds are 1 250th of a second, 1 500th of a second, something along those lines. Let's say you wanted a faster shutter, like 1 2,000th of a second. If you do that, you will get a shutter that looks like the video on the right, where you have both curtains that are following each other. One, one curtain that's opened and then another one that's following quickly behind and you will expose only a very narrow portion of that image um, because of the flash that you just took. So effectively what this means is that shutter speed doesn't matter when we're talking about flash photography. Now what I, and let me qualify that a little bit by saying it doesn't really matter when we are relying on flash as our primary source of illumination. Perhaps we're relying on other light as well, and that complicates things just a little bit. But when we're using just flash to illuminate our scene, shutter speed doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's faster. It doesn't matter if it's slow or fast. As long as we are no faster than that X-Sync speed, it will still properly expose that scene because the flash is hopefully properly illuminating it. So let's come back to this idea of the guide number, which is basically just a measure of the distance times the f number. The reason that we can simplify it to this is that it almost always assumes an ISO of 100, an ISO value of 100, which also eliminates that from this equation as well. So shutter speed is not relevant here because it doesn't matter. ISO is, is assumed to be ISO 100, and so what this means for our flash is that in order to properly expose something that's some distance away, the way that we change how powerful that flash is, quote unquote, is to alter our F number. So by altering our F number, this is now the last exposure value that we have in flash photography in order to try to expose something some distance away. Now there are we do have, of course, the ability to change our ISO as well, and then we would be able to alter how, how far away we are able to expose something. But let's remove that for just a moment and talk about this simplification where we're at ISO 100 and we have a specific guide number. Okay, so let's talk about specific values. Let's say that we have a guide number of 13 meters, or about 40 feet. So this is a common guide number. Again, this is at ISO um, 100. It's not exactly 40 feet. It's like 39 point something, but it's close enough. So what this essentially means is that for this particular flash that has a guide number of 13 meters or 40 feet, that if we have a subject that is 10 feet away, I know precisely what my F number should be. I have a guide number, which is right now I'll use Imperial units, if you don't mind, 40 feet, and we have a subject that's 10 feet away times some F number. The F number should be 4. 
So F4 means that I will properly expose with a flash with this guide number at ISO 100 and my camera set to the X sync speed, I will properly expose something that's 10 feet away. So if something is 20 feet away, how much less light are they going to get? So we double the distance, which means that that object that's 20 feet away is now receiving how much less light than my object 10 feet away? One fourth. A two stop reduction, which is probably going to mean the difference between properly exposed and not properly exposed. So something that's 20 feet away in our camera that's set to an F number of F4 using a flash with this guide number at all of those other settings that we just alluded to that we just talked about in the past. We properly expose the 10 feet away and 20 feet away is just too dim for it to be exposed. Now we can see how we can adjust this as well. What happens if I have an F number of 2.8 instead? So this was an F number of But if I have something at an f value of 2.8 times, this means that I will be able to expose something about 14 feet away. So again, it's a just a, an approximation. But this is a pretty easily this is a pretty easy uh, division that we can do here. Now, what's interesting about this is that we also get to see these two ideas, our discussion about F numbers and how we have these sort of wild numbers that differentiate by roots of two, and this idea that I just talked about before, this inverse square law, the light fall off that happens extremely quickly. We can see that even though we are a stop brighter in our F number, our distance has only increased by a small amount. It takes an additional stop in order to properly expose something that's 14 feet away. And that's kind of incredible, I think. And this really, again, it has to do with just these two fundamental ideas that we've been talking about. What the F number actually represents and why it's separated by, by, uh, by root 2, and also this light fall off. So think about this. And this is kind of an interesting idea that you'll have to, um, that you'll have to take away. One of the things that you might want to consider is now if I increase my ISO to 200, how does that actually impact all of these calculations? Well, if I increase my ISO to 200, I'll just do the takeaway here and uh, hopefully you can sort of think about it on, on your own, is that if I increase my ISO to 200, what I'm effectively doing is increasing the sensitivity, so to speak, of my camera by one stop, which means that at f4, I now am able to expose something at 14 feet away rather than at 10 feet away. So sort of the easy way to compute the difference in ISO and f number is to first look at the guide number at ISO 100, figure out how many stops away it is in terms of f number, and then sort of push that to your new ISO and then use that as part of your calculation. All right, if there's questions about that, I realize that this is sort of, even though it's a relatively simple equation, there's still a couple of things to wrap your head around. So do give it some thought and certainly ask questions to the SAF list or in section, because I do want to mention a couple of other things as well. Now, the way that you would be able to capture extremely fast things that actually occur without the use of some extremely expensive camera like the Phantom that is able to take thousands of frames a second and just capture one of those frames, if you actually wanted to take an image that was that fast, that was beyond the shutter speed of your particular camera, you can use the power of flash for this. Recall that I said that, that the flash can fire in a speed that is much, much faster than your fastest shutter speed. Typically, we would have at, uh, we, we have the ability to alter the power of manual flashes. And if we just assume for just a moment that at full power we have a flash that operates at one one thousandth of a second, 
imagine how you as an engineer, if you were a flash engineer, you might actually try to change the power output of that flash. I would argue that one of the things that you could do would be to decrease the amount of time that that flash actually fires. So if I give off full power at 1 1,000th of a second, I can give off half power at 1 2,000th of a second. We'll call it we're talking about flash here, not shutter speed. This is the distinction that we're making. But it's sort of the same idea, right? If we're able to release half as many photons, then we're, then we're decreasing the amount of light that we're outputting by a stop. So what if we kept doing this? What if we went to a fourth of, a, uh, you know, one quarter power, which would be one four thousandth of a second, and so on and so forth? Now, this is actually really interesting because this means that we could reduce the power output to its smallest setting, and we would not get very much light, presumably, but we would get a flash that occurs very quickly. And it is this idea that we can leverage in extremely high-speed photography. So the task here is not to actually use, is to realize that you're not actually using a fast shutter speed. In fact, you want the opposite. You want a room that is completely dark except for your flash that is not firing constantly, obviously. But you want to have the flash that will be your primary source of illumination. Set it to its lowest power and set your shutter speed to be very long. Just capture all of the light. And because there is no light in the room, it doesn't matter. It will just be capturing darkness. Until that moment that the flash goes off in that instant at 1 64,000th of a second or whatever the maximum capacity of your flash happens to be you will capture some event that occurs at that time frame. Dr. Dr. Uh, Edgerton um, has a lot of wonderful examples, especially in his very early trials with flash photography. And now we've taken this to extreme where you might actually be able to, scientists in the past have actually captured light in motion through a medium through, the, through this sort of technique, which is sort of kind of interesting. But it also is kind of a little strange that you have to think about this in a slightly different way, that you want to use, in fact, a long shutter speed rather than a very fast shutter speed to try to capture something very quickly. But this, in fact, is one of the ideas that you can use for project two. So the trick here is not necessarily the setup, though it is obviously very important to have a very dark room, to have some event that occurs very quickly that you want to capture. The trick is getting the flash to fire at precisely the right time. And doing this manually is not going to work. When we're talking about the difference of thousandths of a second, you're not going to have the reaction time necessary to capture this precise moment in time. Instead, what you will typically do is build a circuit that responds to noise. So for example, imagine how this was set up. There was a camera in a dark room. There was a flash unit. There was a gun off to the side, an apple. The, the gun was very carefully aimed at the apple. Somebody fired the gun, there was a loud bang from, that, from, the, uh, from the bullet exiting the, the, the weapon. And after some amount of time, it actually went through the apple. So there was a circuit that Dr. 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 Edgerton devised, and which you can actually recreate on your own, that responds to noise and then fires a flash, tells the fire to flash after a certain delay. So I'm sure they did a lot of sort of guess and check to try to figure out exactly the right amount of time delay to actually fire the flash after the sound of the gun going off. This is precisely the idea that you can implement and it's kind of a cool thing to know that you can do it yourself. So if you're at all electronically inclined, the circuit I don't think is that complicated. We, we link to some descriptions and ideas on the project, but do take a look at this because you can also generate fantastic images yourself. Now, what can go wrong with flash, of course, are all of the things that you have seen in the past with your own images, with other people's images, or what have you. Do you remember that picture in White Sands of my brother that I was using as an example for exposure compensation? Well, that's him just 12 years ago in the same place, by the way. But this was well before I understood all of the values of exposure. And I was like, OK, it's a dark place. I'm going to use flash. But there's a lot of stuff that went wrong in this particular case. Can you identify some? Just tell me what I did wrong here. Well, not, well I mean, I, I definitely did some stuff wrong. But tell me what went wrong with the flash in particular. 
it's all the typical Flash stuff. Can, can you name some? Red Eye. Red Eye. Perfect. Anything else? That's the moon, actually, back there. The light behind the object is, in fact, the moon. But obviously, that's not, I mean, if you have to ask, it's not very well captured. I mean, that's, but if you look just very close to the moon, you can see something weird about the, the clouds, right? There's some motion blur in the clouds, for sure. But is there anything else? There's one more thing that's bad about this. Oh, well, OK, there's several things. It's out of focus, but ignoring the focus. Sorry? Shutter speed. The, so yeah, so the, the shutter speed was long, which is probably accounting for the motion blur in the clouds. And I was hand holding this, and so that sort of accounts for some of the, the blur in my brother and sister, and also the blur in the clouds. But there's one more thing, which is a little subtle, which is this harsh shadow behind them. So you can see that, yeah, there's a little bit of sand that's illuminated. But very quickly, because of light fall off, we don't see any of that. And that's arguably the cool thing about this shot, or about this location, is being able to see that sand. And so all of the, the, what was neat about this was, in fact, destroyed by the use of flash. So how can we overcome this? Well, think about what's happening with the eye. The, when you cause a flash to fire, it's generally very close to the camera itself, to the lens itself. And so when it fires, it causes light to go through the iris of the person uh, that you're photographing, bounces off the retina, comes back, and you're essentially seeing the back of their eye. You're essentially seeing the red of their eye. So this is harsh, bounces off the retina. Yeah, there's red eye reduction, but that stuff never works, especially because it's very dependent based on age and physiological uh, differences between people. Some people actually respond better than others to that pre-flash idea of uh, uh, some, the, so the way that some red eye reduction works is that it fires a flash and then hopefully it tries to constrict the iris a little bit so that this uh, reduces the problem a little bit of the light actually bouncing through the back and then back to the lens, but it doesn't work. It's terrible. It doesn't, doesn't ever work. But the way that you can actually eliminate a lot of these problems is to actually move the flash off the camera. So part of the problem was that what you had was this flash that, because of its very narrow angle, compared to that of the lens, let's say we have a, you're going to see my wonderful artwork here. Have a person, have a camera. Oh boy, this is going to be bad. And you have a flash. All right, so this flash comes over here, comes into this person's eye, and then reflects back in that way. So this angle right here is extremely small, especially when you have any sort of relevant distance. It's basically zero. It's essentially zero. That, that light is being sent in and directly bounced back into the lens. So if you move the flash off the camera, even just a few feet, what happens is that you have this flash that's up here on this sort of silly looking device, and it increases the angle by a great deal. So what this means is that this reflection comes in and it bounces down and doesn't actually enter into your camera's lens. So moving the, cam the flash off the camera is a great way to do this. But this also fixes that issue of the shadow, where the reason that we have the shadow was that the lens, or rather the, the flash, was just off axis to this person. So it was causing this shadow for this person that was very close behind the person. And our camera was capturing that shadow. By having a flash unit that's distant from the lens, it, in, it still has a shadow, obviously. It's still casting a shadow. But it just so happens that that shadow is at a much, much harsher angle and you don't actually generally capture it within your camera. So it's sort of interesting that having something that looks like this can actually solve these particular issues. So there's a couple of things that you need to do. You need to generally have a cable that can actually fire the flash remotely. There's even fancy wireless devices that allow you to have the camera, or rather the flash, completely off the camera, which is kind of cool. And a variety of other techniques like this. Now, a couple more things I want to show you. One of them is this context of, imagine you have a very long shutter speed. You have, and by that I mean you have several seconds. 
So you open the, the shutter, you fire the flash at some point, and then you close the other shutter. But the question is when in that time that those two curtains are open, do you actually fire the flash? Do you fire it at the beginning? Do you fire it in the middle? Do you fire it at the end? Does this actually have an impact on your image? And as a matter of fact, it matters a great deal. When do you want to see, if you have a very long exposure and you have some motion in that image, when you fire the flash in that exposure makes a huge difference as to what that image actually appears. So this is a little counterintuitive, but if you actually fire it as soon as you open that first curtain, think about what happens. You open that first curtain, you fire the flash, you get some illumination, and then that object continues to move for the duration of the exposure. So what you actually see is sort of the opposite of what you would expect. You get, you capture the moment in time, you capture the exposure of that object at the beginning of its motion throughout that shutter, that throughout the shutter, the time that the shutter was open. So it almost looks like it's moving backwards, which isn't necessarily what you want. What you want, perhaps, is to have second, cut, second curtain sync or rear curtain sync, they're, syn they're synonyms, which means that you open the, the shutter, some action happens that you capture, and then you fire the flash at the last instant right before you close the second curtain. And because that action had occurred throughout the time that the shutter was open, and then you finally capture the, the uh, final exposure at the very end of it, does it actually appear as though objects have that proper movement forward through time? Now, there's a lot of other cool stuff that you can do with flash, like stroboscopes. Um, it's actually this very idea that allows you to have uh, to exceed the X sync speed on your particular camera. Imagine if you can just fire the flash many, 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 many times in a row at relatively low power, you could still compensate for those two curtains moving without exposing the entirety of the sensor and uh, exceed your X sync speed. Sometimes this is useful. Some flash units, you can actually, even though they're older, they have full manual control and you can actually use them on your camera, but do be careful. Some of the older ones have very, very high voltages across the contacts that actually fire the flash, and these high voltages can uh, ruin your digital cameras if it is not ready for it. So there is a way to actually check. We'll post the link on the course website. It's called SafeSync. It's just one way of checking. It's not necessarily the, um, the, the I mean, the, really the way for you to tell is to measure it, but you can sort of search around the internet and try to be sure that is actually going to work for you. This flash, the Vivitar 283, is actually a very popular flash for people that are just getting started with flash photography, and I recommend it if you're going to do that. Now, fail flash is perhaps one of the most important things when we're talking about flash in terms of what we can do with it now without having to get fancy with lighting. It provides extra illumination for what might otherwise be a harsh exposure, backlit exposure. This just so happens to be a very fortunate coincidence that as I was taking a photograph of this, um, of this roller coaster, the flash from the roller coaster's camera, you know, that takes a picture of everybody, happened to fire at exactly the same time. It's a very lucky uh, capture, and this did occur at 1 32 hundredths of a second. And there's my brother again, sort of hiding. So it was very fortunate that we were able to do this. Now, in the last few minutes of class, I did actually want to discuss just a, um, a couple of things. One of them, uh, or not discuss a couple of things, um, but actually to sort of launch us into this idea of actually being able to discuss some of our photos in class. And I wanted to start out by presenting some of my own images for critique. So I have this image here, which I took in LA some number of years ago. And really the goal of this is to do like an in-person critique. And so I have one of mine here that I want to sort of get critiqued and sort of talk about it a little bit. And then in the last few minutes, um, please do sort of stay for just a few minutes over so that we can actually talk about one of your peers who has very kindly uh, allowed us to show one of hers. So. What do you think? John, you want to get the ball rolling? Can you make any 
comments? Can I full screen it? That is an excellent question. Right oh yeah, I know how to use a computer. <laughs> cool. So I apologize, it's a little dark here, um, but maybe that's in fact a problem with the image. Actually, do you want to like come up here? I have a little oh, microphone. Oh wait, I have to turn this on. Can everybody hear me out there? Cool. Um, <laughs> overall, I like the photo. The the lighting from the city itself is really interesting. Uh, the foreground is a little hard to discern. It. I'm assuming there's nothing important there for me to look at, but I'm not positive because it is so dark. Um, I do like that you're sort of using the, I'm assuming it's a tower, uh, a tower or something. I like that you're sort of working that into the frame and working that into the picture. A lot of times when there's something in the way of what you're trying to look at, in this case, Dan was probably trying to get a good picture of the city lights, um, but he happened to be standing near that that uh, that tower, right? So instead of trying to avoid the tower, he was like, well, how can I work that into my frame? How can I use it to make my composition more interesting? So I think that that makes it uh, pretty cool. Actually, that's very uh, perceptive. That was sort of the point was that I wanted to mix the two ideas of actually having the, the city in the frame, but I didn't just want it to be a standard sort of long exposure shot of, of the city itself. I also wanted to sort of capture that. And one of the things I liked <coughs> was this bush that's sort of swaying in the wind a little bit and you can sort of see it, but it's very oh, yeah. subtle. It's like a very subtle thing, but you can in fact see that there's some motion there. Um, very cool. So from this, thanks John. So from this I actually adjusted my position because I, I thought, well, okay, you know, it, it looks more like a mistake than it does an intentional photograph. So I tried moving a little bit and despite all of the sort of warnings that, that it had, I decided to try uh, this instead. So any thoughts on this particular adjustment on this image? So now what I've basically done is I've moved myself and my tripod into this, the base of this tower. And I'm now trying to capture specifically perhaps the, um, the, the warning sign above and the still capturing the lights, but trying to frame it a little bit better. Any thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, like you were saying, I like that it's closer to the object, so there's more intent behind uh, working the object into the shot. It's more pleasant because you couldn't get any closer to where it was. Uh, I, the exposure looks great on the city. It's still dark in the foreground. And maybe the bottom half of the photo, again, isn't really that important. So if I can rehash that for those watching at home, I think there were sort of uh, three major things that I took away. I'll try, to, I'll try to capture them all. One of them that you mentioned last was that the sign, even though I tried to capture it, was in fact cut off. And so that is in fact distracting. That again, um, if I can paraphrase your words, at least to me it looks a little, it looks, it looks distracting, but also it looks like an accident. Like I didn't notice the sign perhaps or that I didn't mean to include it as part of that, because otherwise, perhaps I would have taken a step back to actually capture that. Um, some of the other things that you mentioned were that uh, the, the, the framing was perhaps a little bit better overall, because now it doesn't look quite so much like, oh, it just so happened to be, there just so happened to be a tower right there um, that I was trying to capture. Um, and I've actually like moved within it to be, to sort of capture that idea a little bit more. Um, and also that uh, I think one of the other things that you mentioned was that it's just still so dark down here that it really gives it off this air of uh, like not importance. This, this area of the image is in fact not that important at all. So why did I bother capturing it? Well, I don't really remember, I'm, uh, to be honest at this point, what I was trying to do with these, th these two shots. I just remember th seeing this structure and thinking that it looked really neat with regard to the city, but it was really, really difficult to sort of capture both. This, this, or there's really three things here that, that I think I was trying to capture. One was 
the, the city itself, but also the fact that this was a park within the city. This was along Mulholland Drive on, in, in LA. Um, but that also, even though I was in this park, we still couldn't get away from the fact that there was this, this industrial aspect to it. The city still had its, its presence in this area. And so part of this was a little bit of the bias that I had coming into this, this photo. And what I ended up with was this, was this third photo where I tried to really eliminate a, uh, some of the distraction and try to focus on the structure itself. So this is from the same tower, the same everything, except that now I've altered my perspective a great deal to capture the tower itself. And also you can still see hints of these other aspects that I had mentioned. You can still see a hint, for example, of the glow of the city below. You can still see a hint of the park that was there. But also I think I really enjoy like the, the geometry that came out of this, the, the analysis of that, that we can do of the geometry of the tower itself and that we can actually see what it's used for before, unless you read the sign, perhaps it wasn't totally clear what that tower was. I mean, yeah, we could probably guess it was an electrical tower, but it wasn't super clear. But now it's a lot more clear what's going on, that this is in fact power lines, or probably power lines, and, um, and that it sort of gives that a little bit more context as well. So this, really what, what I wanted to do here was just to show some of my own work and some of my own thought process for going through this. And so um, this sort of conversation is something that I want to have on a grander scale as well that we have on the, that we have on the blog, but also here in lectures and when possible in person in sections or even online in sections. But I'm not expecting, we're not expecting you to submit sort of your, your evolve, your evolution of your photos as you actually work on this. This is just sort of one insight into the way that I worked a particular image as I actually did this. So um, if you will allow us just a few more minutes, um, Caitlin actually decided to show us one of her photos and she has uh, decided to give, um, allowed us to critique it as well. So do you want to come describe this for us? Oh, one second, one second, let me give this to you. Well, it's for the folks at home as well. Um, so I work for a school district and our homecoming was this week. So um, I jumped out onto the track and the marching band was coming on and the conductor climbs up onto this big ladder. Um, and I just really liked the balance between um, everyone looking up at him and him kind of isolated on the sky up there. I struggled with going back and forth between color because homecoming's so much about school colors, but the ladder was bright yellow and the sky was kind of gray, so I thought making it black and white kind of helped with the classicness of band, but I'd be interested to hear what you guys thought. Thanks. So I'll, I'll give some, some thoughts first. Um, normally, uh, I, I don't think, have I done my rant yet on black and white? Normally I rant about black and white um, because I think, it's, I think it's overdone and I think some people tend to do it just to make it look more uh, vintage or impactful in some way. But I think there are times when it's actually very successful and I think this is one of them for a couple of reasons. One is that it is, it is actually, uh, it's very much black and white. It's very simplified in that, in that color scheme, back black and white. You have the, the white sky and the, uh, the black conductor at the top, but yet there's the, the ladder itself which has some very bright tones to it that's still sort of, it's, it's very well split in all of these ways. Um, there is this sort of idea that the bottom third of it is very busy, but there's a simplicity to the very top of it. It's, I think it's uh, really well done overall, and I, I enjoy this image. Um, I enjoy this image a lot. I like it that it's also squared up very nicely with the, the sort of the middle line here, um, and that it just, is it seems like no accident that they were practicing in that manner. And it's neat that you were able to, um, to capture that as well. Other thoughts? Yeah. Would you mind saying some words and s just so that I don't have to uh, rehash everything for the folks watching from home? 
Um, well, I guess that what I appreciate, one is the moment, um, you, these hands are up, it seems to be the appropriate moment to take this photo, because I think you would lose something. And the black and white makes sense because of the, the amount of detail and also the forms that appear. Um, like I, I'm, I'm drawn to the lines, of course the ladder, um, the rungs, and then the lines in the field, and then the lines on their jacket, the lines on his clothing, and then the circles with the drums and then the zero. So um, those become very important. And I think that that color, I'm imagining the color of just the uniforms and the drums alone would distract us. So I think it works really well. And um, But the hands, that moment where you isolate him, so this idea that you have a crowd, but yet he's alone, that that's a really interesting moment too, and a nice sort of um, uh, contrast of subject matter. So I, I really appreciate this. Thank you. Yeah, it's sort of interesting that there is there's hints of Project One in there. There's the hints of the the circles here. There's hints of the the rectangles, and that's sort of neat that um, that that idea is sort of exists, if not intentionally, at least accidentally. And, and actually, that's a really good point that that you're making about the hands because it, it's, it's, it's o it, there is this, th there's this sense of, of control that th that hand gesture has um, that may not have been there if the hands were a little bit, uh, were a little bit lower. Yeah, Johnny, wanna? Oh, I'm sorry, one, yeah, one cup, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I wanted to say something nice now that I was so critical about the last <laughs> image, um, <laughs> but I, I really like this too, and I think that there's a, an, awesome juxtaposition between the symmetry of the image, like the perfection of, of all the lines and kind of the absurdity of where, where this conductor is positioned seemingly in the sky. And there's also some great leading lines that really pull the eye to where you should be looking in the image. Uh, the converging lines of the ladder, the converging lines on the field all draw your eye to the middle of the image, which is truly the focus of, of that conductor in the sky. I think that was well put together. Thank you. So you had a comment as well? When I saw this picture, for some reason, I thought this picture is for the project uh, of the shapes, the triangle, because um, in here, it's obviously, uh, the center is the triangle, the ladder, and also his hands in this case is like a double triangle. Um, and I was surprised that it's, it's not for project. Yeah, so you've identified more <laughs> shapes. Was, what yeah. is your intention to use this for project one? Uh -huh. um, I was feeling very and it just kind of Oh, okay. Oh, so for those at home, she said that it was, it was not her intention to use it for Project One. It just so happened to be there. So, it's, so there's been a lot of praise for this image, and rightfully so. It's a, it's a wonderful, beautiful image. Is there anything that we could do to improve it? And this would maybe realizing that we may have to nitpick a little bit if you'd be okay with that, but is there anything that we can try to do to say, this image is great, let's make it better? Or is it not possible? Yeah, John. Uh, so I first just want to say that I, uh, I really like the photo, and um, I think it's a little bit subtler than in Dan's, but there's a really great use of geometry here as well. It's a little um, subtler. And I love this photo because it, uh, there's kind of a, a rule in photography, like a general rule of thumb. It's like, don't center stuff. But this is, I think, great because it is centered. Um, so for every rule, you throw it away half the time anyway. Um, but I think a helicopter would have made this photo yeah. way better. Um, <laughs> that's so all that's, that, yeah. that's my nitpick. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, that's, that's an important. I it's interesting that you say it's centered because my first reaction to this is that it's not centered with all of the, essentially all of the action down in the lower third, it's, it's, I mean, I think there's, there's kind of an argument to be made that, yeah, the, the conductor is centered horizontally, but vertically there's nothing, there's that expanse. That's that a great point. It doesn't expect. feel centered. It's an even distribution. Right. Um, uh, cool. Uh, first of all, I love the, f I love the picture. Um, I, uh, I, I, also would generally have a um, bias against black and white, but this is this is a vintage shot. I mean, I, I looked at this and I, I at first thought, what's you know what's Charlie Chaplin doing on that uh, on that on that ladder there? It looks like it could easily be an old it taken a long time ago. Um, 
So then this is totally a nitpick. It would have been cool if you had dropped down two feet or a foot and a half and you had gotten that guy right in the middle below the conductor, his face through the ladder rungs. Now, I, this had to have come together really quickly and it's awesome that you got the hands. So it's totally a nitpick. Um, but since what we're doing here is nitpicking, it would be cool if the guy's face were visible through the ladder rungs. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That's also the, the sort of the one thing that I that I had in mind was that just to just to move it just so slightly, um, there might be an air of mystery involved with that with that player, but because it's not necessarily the subject, and you know, but but that but again, we it it took all of us staring at it for this long to really it's notice. It's yeah. me again. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, um, I, I kept going back and forth, but I think there's a tension that you can't see the eye and you can't see his face. And so I think they parallel each other in such a way that to take that away would take something, some kind of tension. Oh, interesting. So an opposing view that they are, yeah, an opposing view that it's actually more symmetrical in a way to have that person blocked by the conductor and we also cannot see the conductor. That's actually, yeah, really interesting. And also, um, while I was thinking about that same idea, if you were to change your perspective by a foot or two, it might just totally ruin everything else. You might just change the perspective just enough that you no longer get the feeling out of this that you, that you actually do. Now let's do one more. I just thought it might be interesting is this picture is vertical and there's a lot of the sky that doesn't really do much, although, I mean, it's a great picture. I love the picture, but maybe see it as a horizontal shot to catch more of the marching band. I don't know how much more of the marching band there is, but maybe catch a little more of that would be interesting. Oh, interesting. So to reduce the, to reduce the prevalence of the sky a little bit and get some more of the band. Yeah, that would be an, that would be an interesting perspective to see. I think what the thing that struck me, one of the things that struck me primarily about it was in fact that expanse of sky and just how sort of smooth it was. So it's very, it would be hard for me to know without sort of seeing it, what, what that would look like. Anyway, thank you all very much for participating and allowing us to go over for, for a few minutes. Um, if I hope that you will, in fact, send some so that we can do this same thing in, in lectures in the future and we will do better about the timing for that. But if not, um, then do at least do this within your sections as well. And I think this was a great way to see the work that we're all doing and be, be able to comment on that. So with that, thank you all very much for coming. We'll see you again next week.